transferring your skills. So if you've already got skills and you know what you're doing, you have degrees, you have experience, but you happen to be in a position where you're looking for work and you need to figure out where those new career opportunities are, then this webinar is also about that, quite a bit about that, which will be helpful for people who may not be interested in supply chain specifically, but are interested in figuring out how to find work that suits their particular skills and capacities. Uh, we have uh, scheduled, we had two presenters, Bruce Randall and Nicole Jelly. However, Nicole is really sick with the flu and she was not able to join us today. So Bruce is taking uh, over her parts of the presentation. And uh, Bruce Randall is the executive director of uh, CRIAC in Calgary, so the Calgary uh, Employment Immigrant Serving uh, Body, of which there are a number across Canada. There's one in Edmonton as well called uh, Eric, and then there's one in Toronto called Triac, and there are more and more springing up everywhere. So it's a support for people who uh, are immigrants and are looking for work. And Nicole Jelly is the Executive Director of Talent Pool Calgary, and she is uh, she helps all sorts of different uh, different graphic groups find work and employers to find the people that they're looking for, and then education for everybody so that they can all improve their their workplace skills and uh, matching people and skills. So um, Bruce has a, an illustrious uh, biography, which I, I only put a little piece of in, into this because there wasn't a lot of room, but he, uh, he was part of, he was the founding person and executive director for the Calgary Regional uh, Immigrant Employment Council. Uh, he works with the Urban Aboriginal Initiative. Uh, he does a lot of mentoring, a lot of uh, uh, the teaching, and uh, it, he's a very sought-after speaker. And both Bruce and Nicole have uh, a career that a past career in supply chain. So they both. The reason that I asked them to speak on this particular con uh, webinar is because they have a lot of experience, have worked in a number of different capacities in supply chain, and they also recommend supply chain and are connected with supply chain organizations and employers in supply chain who are looking for workers. And uh, they will, uh, they, they had a lot to offer for it, and Bruce is going to be explaining all of that to you in just a minute. So now that we've done the introductions, my name is Marie Gervais. Maybe you didn't mention that in the beginning, and uh, I'm the CEO of Shift Management. We host these webinars monthly. We have one webinar usually that's for employers to find out about best practices, and another webinar the next month that's for newcomers to find work in Canada in their field. And sometimes the webinars cross both. So in this case, the webinar that Bruce is going to present to you crosses both of those demographics. And so I'm going to just uh, hand the rest of the presentation over to Bruce right now. Bruce, good morning. Great, good morning. And welcome to the webinar. Thank you so much for your preparation and to work in getting this ready. And I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Great. Thank you very much, Marie. Uh, so welcome all. I see it's a nice small group. I recognize some names, um, some names from uh, Calgary here. So uh, yeah, I did want to kind of roll through this more um, in terms of uh, a conversation. Um, I want you to come away with a few key learnings and uh, and um, and then either contact me later um, so we can follow up or or um, um, sort of apply these in the work that uh, you fellows do. Um, so welcome. I'm very excited about uh, about being part of this webinar. I think uh, the main piece of um, I have had the uh, great opportunity to be able to transfer my own skills uh, through a number of different um, uh, careers. I think I'm on to career number four now, and at 60, I guess, in Canada, I may be uh, ignorant. Uh, I think people have probably gone through seven or eight different career changes. Um, and I've had an opportunity to look at supply chain in particular without even thinking I had been in the supply chain business through uh, three of those. So one was as a uh, young fellow in northern New Brunswick working at a pulp and paper mill, uh, and uh, I realized uh, uh, later that I was in the supply chain uh, uh, sector, uh, even though I was in uh, pulp and paper and manufacturing. And then after I did private practice law in uh, New York, Toronto, and Montreal, um, I took a job as in-house counsel with CCM 
uh, the hockey company and um, uh, manufacturing and uh, wholesaling um, uh, very much depend upon the supply chain uh, to get things done and then I was fortunate enough to be the general counsel with the Frizzani group so that's all of your sport check stores and sport expert stores so about 450 stores across Canada prior to being sold to Canadian Tire and the supply chain world was where you made a break um, uh, your year um, and I certainly got a good lesson in that uh, playing different roles um, so that's probably my uh, probably the best qualification for me being on the line that uh, without even realizing that I was in the supply chain business and I think that's probably uh, one of the overarching themes that we can talk about uh, we can talk about over the next half hour or so uh, so what we want to do generally is we want to look at uh, a couple of things we want Okay, um, skills, uh, what's needed today, what's needed tomorrow. We're going to touch upon briefly upon who are you. Uh, so what are your skills that uh, you have developed through your experience, your training, and even your aspiration, and, and, and how could those be transferable into different uh, sectors. Um, and then the part two of that is how can you tell others who you are. Um, and so we're going to walk through just a little bit of that, just a wee bit of a primer. And then we want to take a look at uh, what could this mean in the supply chain itself. Uh, so first of all, what is the supply chain? Uh, where is it going? And, and uh, how can I be part of it? Uh, just to set the stage a little bit, when we're thinking of supply chain, you're thinking of basically um, positions like purchasing, transportation, logistics, IT, housing, inventory control, customer service, uh, contract administration, senior management. Uh, when I was at Prisani's, um, the supply chain people that we hired came from the grocery business. And the reason they came from the grocery business is because they were the best supply chain people in the world. And John Frizzani's philosophy is that if you could get a uh, head of lettuce from California uh, to a plate in Calgary in three days, then you understood supply chain. And um, that's why I think Frizzani's was probably one of the world's best uh, sporting goods uh, operations because it truly understood the supply chain business. And uh, I think that's what gave it uh, truly a competitive edge. Um, so let's get back into our slides here. Um, the future of work, we put this slide up, and you're going to see thousands of slides like this um, everywhere you look. So if you're on LinkedIn, uh, a slide like this pops up uh, at least once a day. Uh, I think Lee sends uh, me a, a, something like this once every week or two. Um, and basically what we wanted you to get out of this, and this particular slide is uh, from the Institute for the Future, the University of Phoenix Research Institute, just to let you know that indeed um, the skill sets that are going to be required tomorrow are going to be clustered around things um, like your technology, um, your ability to thrive in the new media uh, ecology, your ability to be connected globally, and that's in terms of uh, uh, world perspectives um, and other things. Um, organizations are going to look different, um, and so what I think this slide uh, is intended to show really is that as an example of the skill sets that you're going to be required um, uh, to have, to perfect, and to home going forward uh, include these larger clusters. Um, and the skills that are within those clusters uh, can vary from conversation to conversation and from expert to expert, but you'll see some of them uh, on the slide up there. Um, so we want you to know that you're going to see hundreds of these um, over the course of your career and just know that there are uh, people who are thinking about what kind of skills do you need for tomorrow. Um, those are the theorists. When you're looking at a job ad, you're looking at HR people and hiring managers, and, and, and so they may be drilling down on something very specific. The whole idea is to know that uh, uh, skills will be changing, will be evolving quite rapidly, and it's incumbent upon all of us to be sort of part of that. I want to talk a little bit about the supply chain. And if you think of the supply chain, um, uh, as I mentioned before, think of all those different activities that happen within the supply chain and invariably you have probably been some part of that uh, process as well and you might not have had the bigger picture 
but you certainly have probably had a fairly narrow picture. And if you worked at all in retail, manufacturing, wholesale, um, then you have certainly seen this. But you can also envision this, for example, within uh, EPC organizations or engineering procurement and construction companies. Uh, very important. Uh, so take a pipeline company, for example. Um, somebody's got to be to uh, a source pipe. Someone's got to be able to negotiate price. Someone's got to be able to prepare the contract, complete the contract, got to get the pipe into wherever the pipe is going. Once the pipe lands, it becomes inventory. Someone's got to look after the control of that inventory. You've got site managers, project managers, and so um, all the way up to senior management. So supply chain is a rather large group. Uh, letting you know that supply chain opportunities in the future are definitely huge. I mean, this is um, uh, for something from uh, the industry sector council. Looking at, you know, tw currently 27,000 current vacancies with an additional need for probably 60,000 per annum going forward. Other stats I've seen have called for, uh, in fact, the Calgary Logistics Council, which is a group of logistic experts here in uh, Calgary, uh, that there's 90,000 plus jobs currently in supply chain. We're probably going to need at least 50 to 60 on an annual basis. And so while the experts vary a little bit in terms of the numbers, I think the takeaway is that uh, this is a field that's going to be large. So certainly opportunities within supply chain. Um, so we sort of laid a little bit of the groundwork. Oh. Sorry, Marie, I think I skipped on to something here. You know, so you want to take this service? Skip, yeah, yeah okay. you didn't skip anything. Uh, that's great. Thank you for that introduction and also for letting people know where all these great job opportunities are, which I think is what everyone is worried about. So many people have said just... You know, my job in the oil and gas industry is no longer viable, then I ha there's nothing I can do. But in fact, there are many things I can do. So that's what this is about. Can you imagine yourself working in another field? If you can, uh, you know, check them off. And it, 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 we would have added a lot more, but the survey is limited to just 10 entries. So we just put a few in there. So how can you imagine yourself working in any of these fields? And then we're just going to look at results in a second here while everybody's busy checking them off. I love how this group of people on the call are so keen to click. Sometimes we have to beg people to click on the surveys, but it's not happening with this group. So there we go. So people can see themselves working in tourism, in supply chain, awesome, since that's what this is about. Environment, also very big. Um, and of course, in energy and other kinds of the changes in energy are happening and uh, we're going to be merging and, and evolving into that as well. So uh, mining, electricity, uh, pretty much everything people, somebody can see themselves working in and uh, the, 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 the supplies are, supply chain pieces is a big part of all of that, right Bruce? Yes it is. Yeah, Absolutely. So that's, that's good for the survey for now. Great, perfect, excellent. So um, back to sort of this whole you know, the big arching theme of the overarching theme about uh, skills. Uh, very much, and, and the work that I do on a regular basis, uh, whether I'm teaching at Haskain or I'm teaching at Regent College or teaching at Mount Royal or working with the folks that I work with, is this idea of understanding who you are. And I think if you understand who you are, and there's many facets to that, the facet I want to focus on today is what skill sets do you have? And even if you're a student working on a master's in university, you have many of these skill sets um, um, that once you recognize that you've got them, um, you can give some greater plot to, okay, how would I connect my particular skill set to the skill set that may be required in another industry, uh, whether it be supply chain. I, I remember a few years ago uh, when I first started in this part of the business, and this business being uh, connecting internationally trained professionals, um, somebody was looking at a, at a headline in the Globe and Mail, and the headline read, 75% of internationally trained professionals not practicing in their field of, of expertise. And, and uh, those sitting around the table uh, who had a social science bent said, well, that shows you the sort of the disconnect between immigration policy and who lands and all that sort of stuff. And, and because I was new to this sector, um, that's not the way I thought. And the way I thought was, oh, is it only 75%? Um, and a lot of folks sort of asked me, you know, so what do you mean is it only 75%? And I said, well, I thought it would have been higher because 
uh, many of the Canadians that I know, in fact, virtually every Canadian that I know, is not doing what they were so-called quotation marks trained to do in university. Um, I went to McGill, um, so four years of law, two languages, and two legal traditions. Um, Seventy-five percent of my classmates at McGill are not practicing law. So you think if you got into McGill, you worked hard to stay in McGill and to graduate, you'd be practicing law. But indeed, uh, they weren't. And so they were working in banks, and they were heads of uh, nonprofit organizations. And one guy was, uh, you know, they had a railway. Um, the, we were trained to be problem solvers. And as Canadians, most of us are trained to be problem problem solvers. And so I'd use this strategy of figuring out who you are um, and uh, we use it to uh, the greatest benefit to the folks that we work with. And if you want to stay in your field, great, but know that your field is really wider than just engineering or uh, or accounting uh, or law and it includes a, a number of things. Um, so Nicole and I have looked at this from many different aspects over the last four or five years. and. And here are some of the skills that we have identified that most people have to a certain extent. Um, and the question is trying to get people to understand how do we transfer these skills. So we've listed several here, and there are several others. And again, like that earlier slide on skills for the future, um, you can find uh, different people talking about different skill sets. But I think that if you look at things like customer orientation and organizational awareness, uh, your intercultural skills, flexibility, self-control, uh, uh, creative thinking, etc. These are the skills that corporate Calgary in particular is, are looking for. And if you know yourself, if you've done some self-analysis and if you've figured out um, that you do have these skills or you've figured out that you might have a gap in these skills and there are ways of closing up those gaps, that puts you light years ahead of most other people. So take today, for example, um, tough economic times, and if you have an understanding of who you are, um, you have a uh, an additional tool that you're able to use that can help you move into whatever your next career is going to be. I was listening to CBC uh, several months ago when uh, um, uh, Penn West had just let go 400 people on a Tuesday morning or Monday morning, and CBC was interviewing uh, a project manager. The project manager for Penn West had just been let go, and he said he was really hopeful to find something else in the oil and gas business. And I'm listening to this on my way home, and I wanted to stop and call into CBC and say, i got to get a hold of this guy and take him out for coffee because um, he's got a skill set that is needed in project management, and project management is needed in virtually every sector. So somehow he seemed to be limiting himself to the oil and gas sector. And I was thinking, but you're a problem solver with project management skills. You could thrive anywhere. You could thrive in the supply chain business. You could survive and thrive in the nonprofit sector. And so his base skill set of, 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 of being a project manager meant that he undoubtedly had in today's day and age intercultural skills, communication skills, Skills, creativity skills, conceptual skills. Uh, he had uh, uh, numeracy skills. He had team building skills. And those are skills that you can take into virtually any sector, any job at all. And I think more and more Canadians sort of recognize that. Even if you're a university student, when I'm working with my Haskane students, 22, 23 years old, have the exact same conversation. And the conversation is, is if you know who you are, that's a much easier and uh, a route to be able to figure out where do you want to go. Most Canadians, for example, don't graduate and say, hmm, I wonder what my alternative career path is going to be. You're thinking the world's my oyster and I can go wherever I want to go because you understand what your particular skill set is. So Bruce, can I can I uh, yeah, make a little please, yeah. on that? Uh, yeah. I, I think that your point about self-awareness is really important and it, it means that people need to look at 
where their qualities are in areas they may not have looked at before. And and it's not easy to reflect on yourself and say, this is what I'm good at, and these are some of the things that I have skills in. It might be helpful for people to speak with friends and say, what do you see me as being good at? Or, you know, or even um, uh, employers and colleagues and say, you know, what, what would you say some of my strengths are? Because it's not easy to, to look at that and say, oh, okay, that's who I am. It, it's, almost, it's much easier to point it out in someone else, don't you think? Yes, absolutely. And in fact, when I moved from law, so I retired as general counsel with the Frozani Group about 12 years ago and took a full sabbatical. Marie, and my sabbatical took me back to school and I was studying things that I had been doing for the last 20 years but had never really studied. Uh, so uh, uh, finance and and uh, and, and uh, some on the ground, real hardcore leadership stuff. And while I'd been doing it, I had never looked at it from an academic perspective. During the course of that year, I must have had about five or six cups of coffee uh, a week with um, people in, in, in every different sector trying to figure out where my next move may well be. And it was through those cups of coffee that I was able to figure out what I was kind of good at, what I thought I was really good at, but what I wasn't good at at all, or what I didn't really have an interest in, and where my gaps may well be. And, and right towards the end of that sabbatical, and I give myself 365 days exactly. And I said on that 366th day I will be doing something to quite tangible. And um, I ended up getting, getting picked up by a private school and it would not have been a sector that I would have thought of, but it was a sector that exactly fit with everything that I had done, but it took conversations for me to figure out, A, I did have some of those transferable skills, B, where I had a gap, what can I do to fill that gap, and and see where some of those opportunities were. And so whether that's a, you're doing that's a great example. You know, so whether you're doing that through a LinkedIn conversation, whether you're doing that just through various cups of coffee. And then from there I end up getting a tap on the shoulder five years later to start the stuff that I'm currently doing. And so um, that's what it is. It's uh, it's 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 uh, reading, it's uh, uh, speaking and, and speaking could be uh, by uh, a LinkedIn, it could be through uh, different sorts of uh, industry groups. Groups, uh, is really trying to figure out where you want to go, um, uh, and uh, it's something that uh, it means you don't have to spend a lot of money. You don't have to go to placement agencies. I think that they do provide some really good services, but sometimes a trusted colleague uh, in a different sector uh, can really provide you with some uh, with some really good work. I mean, that leads to a whole conversation about mentoring. Uh, while I mentor a lot, I have been mentored and so continue to be mentored, and so as a mentee, I'm open to all sorts of conversations, and if you've had a good life mentor or a good employment mentor or career mentor with you somewhere along the way, um, and they may be not even calling themselves mentors, um, sometimes, as Marie said, you can get that good, honest feedback. And the one thing that I recognize that I did not want is I could not work, for example, with passive-aggressive people. Uh, I couldn't walk on eggshells around an office. And so that limited me to where I wanted to go. I thought the irony is that it opened up avenues to do things that I hadn't even considered. And I found myself working in the nonprofit sector. Um, and if you come from uh, a blue-collar, hard scrabble uh, town that I came from in Northern New Brunswick, that would have been the furthest thing that anybody would have thought that people would end up in. Um, but it matched the skill set and there was a real need in the sector. Um, so, yeah, and I'm sure many of you are having those coffees and having conversations with colleagues. Um, yeah. You know, we can take a look. Are, if, you aren't, if you aren't, you should start because the way to self-awareness is by talking to other people and asking them some questions that help you to move forward. So, which is what you did, and I, I think yeah. sometimes people stay too much in a vacuum. They get really um, stuck on the fact that they don't have work, and they start panicking. And the best mm -hmm. way to move out of that is to is to talk to somebody else and say, "What do you think I'm good at?" And then you start moving out of the panic into, "How can I get into a new field?" And I think that's what you were going to talk to us about next for transferability of skills into supply chain from one place to another, right? Exactly, exactly. And, and so you can imagine having a conversation and you're keeping maybe a mental tally, sort of a mental score sheet as you go along, or maybe even haul out a, you know, you you're meeting with somebody and you're having this conversation so that, for example, if you were a petroleum engineer or any engineer and you were considering, for example, working on the supply chain as what we call a logistics 
uh, the analyst. Um, uh, this is an opportunity for you to figure out, okay, so what does a logistic a logistics analyst uh, need to have, um, and that you can get through any number of places. So there are um, uh, 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 skill bases that you can either find through Industry Canada. You can contact uh, uh, what we used to call the old industry sector councils, or you'll see some of these names at the end of this uh, presentation, different supply chain and logistic groups. And sometimes maybe you're just reading job ads, trying to figure out what are they looking for. Take your skills. So if you're an engineer and you're sitting down and you're thinking, okay, so these are maybe the 15 to 20 things that uh, I know now that somebody in uh, logistics uh, um, will need, what, what do I have that might actually match up? And this is just sort of a rough scorecard. This is, this is not quite a qualitative scorecard yet, but it's sort of a quantitative scorecard. Um, and here we've identified that a petroleum engineer could probably quite easily move into um, um, the logistics world uh, because they're both based on a lot of the things that an engineer brings to the table. And this could count even if you were an engineering student, but you had done a practicum or you had done an internship where you really figured out where some of your skill sets were. So if you've just been recently laid off by Penn West, for example, um, there may be an opportunity in the supply chain business to be able to say, okay, so I've got English, I've got the reading comprehension, I've got my math, and you walk down the list, uh, you'll see what you might not have, and then and you can figure out, okay, it's just, just something that I can learn. So if I don't know anything about transportation, that's a learnable skill. God's sake, I'm an engineer. I'm a problem solver. Most engineers I know, my dad being one of them, thought they could do anything. Um, and uh, and so, you know, learning about the transportation part of the business would be quite easy. Um, my dad would have not done very well on the, on the customer and personal service side, but um, uh, that's something that, uh, that either can be a gap that can be filled, or I think today's engineer, as opposed to the 1950s engineer, um, uh, he has more of an outward-looking personality. Uh, so just sort of an example, if you were a petroleum engineer and you wanted to move into the supply chain, if you were, for example, let's take a look at a second, if you had done um, uh, other things in the oil and gas business, so here we take a look at somebody working at a refinery, and if you wanted to now look at uh, a frontline supervisor of people, what are the skill sets that are required? Quite different uh, in the sense that uh, you're now uh, not just sitting in a, in a cubby hole uh, doing numbers and reporting to the CFO or to the director of finance or or to the director of the warehouse, but now, for example, you might be called upon to lead a group of folks, um, and you might think, well, you know, the job I had in oil and gas, I was kind of by myself. So you're going to have some of those hardcore skills, but you're also going to have a lot of team building skills that you might not actually realize. So doing the quantitative uh, scorecard really helps, and as Marie said, having those really in-depth conversations with other trusted people, uh, colleagues of yours, um, uh, can help you get a qualitative view of what you're all about. So once you once once you figure that out, oh, Marie, we're off to another. We're off to another. another uh, yeah. yeah, we also had we had a uh, question yeah. from Helen. Helen okay. said has. has yeah, so Helen had a, uh, a question. She said that there's a, a portfolio development course that helps people to identify their interests and their skills. Are you aware of that, or do you know where someone could take that course? No, I personally don't, but maybe Helen can sort of uh, lead us in the right direction, either with a link or sort of point us in the right direction. Yeah, so that Helen, feel free to excellent. type something into the chat box to let us know. Um, and then, uh, and also, that just reminded me, thank you. If you have any comments or questions as you're listening to Bruce, please feel free to type them in. Everybody is muted, so you won't be able to speak them just yet, uh, although we could open it up at the end. But for now, uh, if you wouldn't mind typing them in, then uh, Bruce can answer them as we go along. So here are the results for uh, the transferable skills. So, well, we've got lots of people with customer ori orientation digital skills, intercultural skills, and flexibility. Oh, we've got creativity, analytical thinking. We have a really competent group on this on yep. this, uh, <laughs> on this call. <laughs> so, yeah, it's looking really good. And, yeah, just let, 
people see, and this is only the, the tip of the iceberg of delving into your skills and finding out what you can actually do and how you can apply that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. So once you understand uh, and you have a pretty good idea as to who you are and, 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 and you've gone through this score card in however way, shape, or form, and you've got a fairly good understanding of, of who you are, what we have found is the most difficult part is to tell others about that. Um, no use putting it on a resume because everybody puts it on a resume. Everybody um, uh, is able to say on the surface, yeah, I've got this, I've got that. But how do you truly and effectively, um, in a very contextualized manner, tell other people um, that you've got this particular set of skills. So it might come through on a resume if people um, are looking at your education, your experience, and your training, and your volunteer time. Uh, if you've used a lot of the right vocabulary, and by that I don't really mean English as a second language, but I mean you've used a vocabulary that would resonate with an HR director, with a hiring manager. But oftentimes, your sort of following the same route that many others do and I know the HR people on the line will tell you that you probably have six seconds in a resume to impress somebody and in six seconds nobody gets into too much detail but there are so many other opportunities that you have to really let others know um, uh, uh, who you are and what you can do very relevant for the supply chain business as it is for any business um, so if you want to move out of what you're doing Doing currently or what you have been doing and you want to repackage yourself in the supply chain and you understand your skill set, your transferable skills, you know what's required in the supply chain, there still is that difficult hurdle to be able to frame it in a way that will resonate with somebody in the supply chain business. Um, one way, there are really a couple of ways of doing it. One, one is a vehicle and then another way of actually testing this out. The vehicle that we've used, and, and it's always evolving, uh, it's, it's never static, is to uh, formulate these transferable skills around three or four what I call competencies, but here what I'm going to call uh, being able to take those transferable skills and make some sense of what they are. And we have found in the work that we've done with Corporate Calgary and the work that I've done, you know, uh, 30 years uh, working, is if you can identify yourself as a leader, and in Calgary that really means a servant leader, and there's a whole host of things that that means. Um, if you can identify yourself as a problem solver, if you can identify yourself as an adaptable professional and as an articulate critical thinker, you can then put any one of your transferable skills into, into those four larger you know, baskets um, and you can carry on a much more clear conversation. I've been really difficult to have a conversation about I'm a real creative kind of a guy. Um, and instead, if I can tell you a story about um, the way what I did uh, in a previous job or my current job um, led to a creative solution, that really is a problem-solving story. And so in essence, what you're trying to do is now you're trying to tell others uh, your great uh, abundance of skills and the best way of doing that is to sort of frame it in a slightly different manner. We found that these are the four baskets of things that, uh, uh, that the corporate sector um, really seems to sort of take a shine to. Um, and uh, those who are successful seem to be able to, to uh, and tell their experiences, in, a, in essence tell their story uh, based around uh, these. And of course these always tend to overlap. Um, when I do workshops on this in particular, uh, what I'm going to talk about for five minutes is a three-hour workshop, and it's just even then scratching the surface, um, this whole ability to uh, articulate who you are um, based around these uh, 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 more uh, basket-like uh, features is, is uh, I mean, it's real art and a skill. Um, for the purpose of this webinar is ways to test this out. So if you think you've got some transferable skills that are, let's say, good for the supply chain business, um, 
one way of testing this out is to uh, speak to those in the supply chain uh, uh, sector. If you know somebody, great. If you don't know somebody, um, uh, indeed, try to have coffee in what we would call an information session. Um, so uh, you're interested in learning more about, um, for example, what contract administration is like at uh, SNC Lavalin. Um, call somebody up at SNC Lavalin who you uh, can sort of surmise is in that part of um, the supply chain business over at uh, SNC. Um, and if you can wrangle a 20 minute, half an hour cup of coffee with somebody, your opportunity in a very wide ranging conversation to sort of narrow in on uh, your ability uh, to take what you've done in a completely different sector and maybe move it into um, uh, contract administration at SNC Lavalin. For example, we've done this with international trained lawyers who are not necessarily looking to be able to practice law in, in uh, Calgary, but because they can do a number of these things um, in terms of administrating contracts, what they're looking to do is to be able to tell others, for example, at SNC, that um, I feel very comfortable working in contracts, contract administration. I know numbers. Um, uh, but what does a contract administrator really do at an EPC organization like SNC Lavalin? And so that conversation then has provided uh, some insight as to what the supply chain world is all about. You're practicing your story. You might have an opportunity to sort of talk about what you've done. Um, we were working with one fellow from the Middle East and um, we were actually starting on a uh, leadership story and, and he used the word I about 23 times in about 30 seconds to talk about what he had done. First of all, I thought that was physically impossible because he's got to put other words around it to actually make sentences. But when we found out what he did, we gave him sort of a seven-second synopsis of how he can describe himself on a go-forward basis, which could get him into different aspects of the supply chain business. So now his elevator speech is that his company was a pipeline company. His department was responsible for delivering pipe, and his role was to ensure that there's enough time, resources, and people to make that happen. So within seven seconds, he demonstrated to anybody in the supply chain business that he was what we call a servant leader, just the way he framed what he did. He was a problem solver. He had made sure that pipe got delivered. Um, and um, it provided him with a vocabulary that he could speak to people in the supply chain business here in Calgary uh, in a way that would resonate with them. So he had the transferable skills. He understood what those were. His difficulty was to bridge that gap or get over that hurdle so he could talk to somebody in the supply chain business and really figure out um, uh, how to make himself shine. That then affected what his resume looked like and that affected what his cover letter looked like and it affected the way that he carried himself and conducted himself in an in interview. So the transferable skills are there. Whether you're a student, whether you're a newcomer, whether you moved from my neck of the woods in northern New Brunswick, you've got the transferable skills. Um, sometimes what you need is a little bit of help in figuring out, okay, how do I tell somebody locally that story in a contextual manner? And so, uh, uh, that, yes, yeah, sorry, Bruce. I just wanted to mention yeah. that um, we got a whole bunch of uh, good references here from Helen. Oh, wonderful. Just to point out to everybody. So she sent uh, quite a few websites where people can do some self-assessments. But uh, And I think those are extremely valuable because they help you with self-reflection, which is important. But yeah. don't for people on the call, don't discredit what Bruce is saying about talking to other people and looking for organizations that can help. Uh, you know, for example, uh, uh, Craig and... Um, um, and uh, what's the other one? Eric and Track. Yeah. They they do that sort of counseling with people and and met, help them with setting them up with mentors. And you may think, well, yeah, I don't need a mentor. I'm really, I'm I'm a, a competent professional. But everybody needs a mentor for different things that they're doing and to and to help reflect back to them what they're capable of, especially if they've been working for a long time in a certain sector and now they need to transfer into a new one. Don't you think, Bruce? Absolutely. I mean, I remember, um, so here I am, as I said, from a small spot in New Brunswick, and I decided I wanted to be a lawyer and I wanted to article in the most blue blood, biggest law firm in Toronto. I'd never even been to Toronto. And I recognized um, uh, 
a person, not necessarily knowing that person, but sort of recognizing that this might be a small town fellow as well. Uh, this was 30 years ago. Uh, that gentleman is still my mentor 30 years later. And so uh, the power of connecting, the power of the cup of coffee, the power of that mentoring is absolutely huge. And I still go back to Peter and bounce things off 30 years later. And I'm sure 20 years from now, as I'm on to my 15th career of change, um, uh, Pete and I will still be, we, we will still be chatting. Um, this slide right here is really good because what I like about it is, is it's taken uh, four large baskets of, 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 uh, of uh, things that you might be doing in the uh, in the supply chain business. So whether you're in purchasing, and it, these are big categories: purchasing, transportation, inventory control, contract administration, compliance, and process management. And what they've done is they've identified not just transferable skills and not just the baskets of skills that I have talked about to sort of get over that hurdle, but what might you be doing within each one of these sectors so that if you're thinking of, let's say, oh, you know what, I could, uh, uh, I'm, a, I'm a pretty good negotiator, I understand contracts, um, I'm very calm, uh, I can be charming, uh, I think I could really be a good purchaser. And remember, the purchasing is often step one or step two in the whole supply chain. You're now getting whatever it is that you're going to put into your chain of events, um, and as a purchaser, you're often called upon to sort of do that. So the guy that buys the pipe for the pipeline company, the person who buys the Nike sneaker from Nike in a retail operation, that's either step one or step two in the whole supply chain. So what are the so what are the things that sort of you know spin off from there? So if you've got sourcing ability, you've got negotiation ability, you've got some retail experience, if you've got some merchandising experience, um, and that allows you in your conversation uh, or even in your self-reflection about could I even apply for this purchasing job at, uh, at Sport Check or at Canadian Tire, for example. Um, uh, these are the things that you might want to be thinking about um, uh, that would be relevant to the job that you're going to be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so while you think, you know, all I really have is some, you know, some risk management and I've been an accountant for a number of years and I really haven't done anything in manufacturing or in the industry, on the contrary, your ability in risk management might be a springboard to a career in supply chain and, for example, in inventory control. Uh, and remember, in retail, for example, um, shrink, which is uh, what you've lost from what you purchased and paid for to what you actually sell. So you lose things along the way. Remember, that head of lettuce can sort of rot along the way or gets misplaced in a warehouse. The smaller that shrink number is, um, the more profit that your organization is going to earn. Uh, that could be risk management. And, and so your ability to transfer your working for, let's say, uh, a small accountant firm and you've been laid off, you might be an absolute perfect fit. You understand your transferable skills. You understand how to tell others about it. And you can peg it to something specific that that organization needs. For example, in that case would be risk management. Many of my international trained lawyers find themselves working in contract administration and really loving that area and oftentimes not then going on uh, to pursue further careers in law just because this is sort of where they want to be. This is sort of what they did back home or what they did in a previous life. And so they're thinking, you know, this is absolutely perfect. Um, um, process management uh, could be a perfect fit as well. So I've known engineers uh, who have understood processes exceedingly well. They were the people that we would have hired at the Ferzani Group to help us understand how can we be more efficient in our in the processes in which uh, we operate. And the processes might not be engineering processes, but you know what? I want a guy who's comfortable with a slide rule and uh, squared graph paper, uh, figuring out how my process and my company can be way more efficient even if there's no engineering at all involved. And I remember our fellow uh, at Frizzani's uh, found that we could save money if we bought our bags in a different way. And so that was that, was that logical, in-depth 
thinking that only an engineer can bring to a question um, in a completely non-engineering perspective. And he was an absolute perfect set. Um, and he was an integral part of every feature in the supply chain. Um, and I don't think when he left engineering school, he ever thought he'd be working in the supply chain business. But indeed, his skills were perfectly fit for that. Um, and so um, these are just some examples of, of, uh, of sort of how we can move from there. So, Bruce, we're running close to the end of the webinar. Yeah, right? perfect. And uh, perfect so maybe you want to talk a little bit about the resources, and then we yeah. can get to some questions people might have. And if you're thinking of uh, any questions or comments you would like to make now, uh, you know, feel free to type them in, or you might like to uh, you might like to speak them at the end. We'll open up the lines a little bit later. Yeah. There won't be a lot of time for in-person questions, but so please feel free to type them into the chat box so we can get as many in as possible. Yeah, and Marie, you can leave them with my email address, and please do, uh, please do uh, connect with me. Those who know me in Calgary know I've always got time. I always love coffee, and if you're not in Calgary, I always got time on the phone or always have time by email. There are there are numerous resources. We just listed four here. I think if you Google supply chain, um, it takes you to any number of places, and these are uh, some uh, larger organizations or associations or or uh, industry groups um, that uh, are well worth connecting to. Um, uh, there are many more. Um, but there's a piece sort of scratches the surface, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you a question about these uh, resources. So, yeah. like, let's say I wanted to connect with uh, women in supply chain. Do they have a job board? Or or uh, if people were looking for supply chain jobs, would they? Yeah, I mean, they... oftentimes the best way on supply chain jobs is to go straight to companies and to go through their particular job boards. That usually is the best way of doing it. Some of these organizations uh, will will sort of provide with some with either uh, professional development or some guidance. But I always think that the best way of finding out uh, what's out there is to go straight to job boards that organizations have. So, for example, if you're interested in retail, take a look at some of the larger retailers. If you're interested in um, um, in engineering, uh, procurement construction companies, take a look there. Um, uh, I still think, though, that the best way of finding out that kind of information is to sometimes make that call to somebody that you've been able to identify um, and to take that person out and have what we would call an informational cup of coffee. So it's that half hour, 20 minute, half hour, 40 minute conversation with somebody where you're really trying to figure out um, you're not looking for a job, you know, you might not even bring a resume uh, to that conversation, but what you're trying to figure out is what's out there, uh, what's new. Um, so for example, it was my great learning in the world of engineering, procurement, and construction. Um, so I'm connecting with somebody that I know is in the uh, uh, supply chain business over at SNC Lavalin, and I'm thinking I've got a couple of great lawyers that I can certainly connect for contract administration, negotiation, all sorts of great stuff. Well, SNC Lavalin does not hire anybody outside the engineering world to work in that part of their supply chain business. So their orientation is that engineers are the go-to people, um, not only for the stuff that engineers are really good at, but even the stuff that I thought lawyers would be great at. And so my great learning coming out of that is that the EPC world really appreciates people with that science, technology, engineering, and math background. So you don't necessarily have to be an engineer. Uh, if you were a technologist, uh, what it provides somebody at SNC, the hiring manager at SNC, is that uh, that real comfort feeling that that uh, you're a very logical, um, uh, linear person, very analytical in your thinking, and that's the way they run their supply chain. Um, supply chain in retail is completely different. Um, in fact, um, the more creative you can be, if you can find closeout deals anywhere in the world, that may be absolutely perfect for the organization that you're you know, seeking a job in. So what I tend to do with the associations is um, finding out what What's sort of what's new? What are the larger trends out there? What are people saying about uh, about uh, uh, supply chain two years out, three years out, five years out, ten years out? There's some professional development opportunities, um, uh, and 
what are people most concerned about uh, in terms of hardcore jobs and finding out about organizations per se. There's nothing better than than going to some of the trusted job boards, which includes oftentimes job boards at at organizations. And I know not a lot of you know not every job is advertised, um, but in supply chain, uh, and I think in today's day and age, because there's so many great people out there looking for work, um, it behooves organizations to advertise quite widely uh, to find that uh, just that exact right person. So the resources are good to find a little bit more about supply chain, but it's always good to go straight to organizations itself. Yeah. And and so if you don't know anybody, uh, then yeah, it it might. I always find it useful to go to LinkedIn yes. and, uh, and go to the people uh, section where you're doing a search and then type in, for example, supply chain Calgary. Yep. And then a bunch of people who are in supply chain in Calgary will pop up. Their portfolios will pop up. Uh, and so you can take a look at them and say, oh, well, uh, maybe I do know this person or maybe I yeah. could just, here's another person. I, and one person, if, there's, if you want to get introduced to those people, you can send them an email through LinkedIn and say, I'm considering moving into supply chain as a, as a future career move, and I was wondering if you might have some advice for me. And then that can lead to the coffee conversation that you're talking about, because you may not have any connections in supply chain. So exactly. that, that is one way, because a lot of people who are in supply chain, if it's in their portfolio, it's going to come up, and then you can have a chance to talk to someone. That gives you an in into an organization, um, because once you've talked to somebody in person, then you're more likely to be able to uh, find work there or to be referred to for work somewhere else. Exactly, and one one sort of a cautionary note: uh, most organizations tend to tend to define what their own particular supply chain uh, uh, group is really all about. So some people start at different points in the supply chain, and others have you know the full spectrum. And and so oftentimes, if 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 your LinkedIn doesn't pop up people under supply chain, maybe if you drill down a little bit more finite and you look at contract administration, for example, or if you look at uh, 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 purchasing, if you look at merchandising, um, it tends to drill down a little bit more, uh, and 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 you can start to sort of figure out, you know, uh, where do I go? And, and bearing in mind that most organizations um, that are in the manufacturing, uh, in the selling of things, in the putting of things together, um, uh, you have a supply chain uh, process where it starts and where it finishes is, is oftentimes quite dependent on that particular organization. Um, That's a good and then point. the last, yeah, and then the last slide really, is sort we have just like three minutes left, so can you make a sort of yeah, closing? Exactly. So thank you very much. I mean, what I wanted to do is to leave you with some with some visuals on a focus, and 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 what 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 you want to focus on, and ultimately, the most important thing is to be able to communicate who you are to somebody else. And here are the four baskets. So your ability to be a leader, your ability to lead, um, and 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 servant leadership is. Is, is, is probably the safety there. That's what people are really looking for. And secondly, your ability to solve problems. Uh, thirdly, your ability to be adaptable, and that takes on everything from an intercultural to an intergenerational to uh, an interorganizational uh, to a multidiscipline uh, approach, your ability to adapt to as many different circumstances as possible. And then lastly, your ability to articulate this to others. Uh, focus groups that we've done indicate that adaptability and your ability to articulate what it is that you're trying to say in whatever time that you have to make it. So if you've got two seconds to talk to your direct report, you got to be really succinct in two seconds. And so that's the ability to critically think in the moment, in the time, and in context. You put that stuff together, and um, you'll, you'll all have great careers um, in wherever you go, including in the supply chain. Great. So... Uh this was an excellent presentation. I'm sure it helps people think of a lot of things that they can do. Uh, everybody stayed on the line, which is really great, and we had a few people joining us recently or halfway through. And so if you did and you missed something and you'd like to hear it, do not despair because there will be a recording link sent to you that you can have in uh, for the next 48 hours. And after that, we will have the recording on uh, Bruce will probably post it on his website. Nicole will have, have the recording on her website, and we will have it on our shift website as well. 
So um, while you're thinking of any questions or comments that you would like to make, I don't see anything in the chat box just yet. Here's another survey for you. I'm hoping that you found this uh, interesting or, or useful in some way. And so please do our quick little poll. And uh, and then we're going to, I will unmute the line for anybody that wants to stay on the line. We're going to close the, um, you know, the call down officially in about 30 seconds. But for anyone that wants to stay on the line and ask Bruce any questions, we'll, we can stay on for another uh, your five or ten minutes. Hey, Bruce, yeah, if there is absolutely. a desire. Okay. So we've got some uh, results for this. It looks like people found it interesting. That's great. Um, and then here we've got a, a little bit of a reminder of our upcoming webinars. In January, we have intercultural communication and it's understanding cultural conflict styles, which is going to be uh, one of my presentations. I usually do one or two a year on our on our platform. And this one is been very popular. I've been presenting that particular topic uh, quite a bit over the past year and a half, and so we thought we'd put it into a webinar. And then in February, we have uh, networking, and it's networking according to the Sabsi way, as Ahmed and Hossein Sabetkaram, who, uh, who are engineers and also restaurant owners, and they're going to talk about how, what could they do for networking to create business. It's very interesting. And it uh, and involves a lot of uh, cultural tips from, uh, from being Persian, which is lovely. I think you're going to love that one. And then Tom Borg, who is a very big on the customer service and customer experience, will be speaking in March. And so I think those are all going to be excellent webinars coming up. If you're not on our mailing list, we would love to be able to send you invitations to upcoming webinars. We don't pester people. We have four newsletters a year, and other than that, we have uh, webinars coming up. So please say yes, and then we can put you onto our onto our list. And uh, then uh, since we're running close to the end, we've also got some things that we're going to be start launching soon. We have an effective meetings online course that's four sessions of uh, video and documents. And then we have three leadership courses that are daily mobile lessons, 10 minutes a day. And they are, uh, three of them are ready. There are nine in total and the rest are in development. And we have a work and culture part two coming up and also a work and culture for academics looking for work in universities, which we will also be featuring. So anything you're interested in, we will keep you posted. And that way we don't have to bug you about stuff that doesn't matter to you. So it looks like we've got a pretty high interest on a lot of this stuff. Awesome. Really happy to see that. Shift management is who we are, and we shamelessly promote other people. We try to promote everything that's going to be a resource for everyone because we think the more we network and help others, the more everybody benefits. And I'm sure Bruce would agree. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I will uh, unmute the lines, and if anybody has a question they would like to speak, please feel free. The conference free. has been unmuted. Anyone have any comments or questions for Bruce for his presentation? I would like to say that I really enjoyed it, and I especially like the stories that you had to tell Bruce about people you've been working with and about your own trajectory, and that was... It was it was really interesting for me to hear those things. Some of those things I didn't know about you. I've known you for a few years, but I didn't know some of those interesting stories. And you're a perfect example of how to be flexible in your career because you're able yeah. to move from one, one place to another in entire, quite different roles. Oh, yeah. And, and, and I think moving across the country is, is uh, I mean, I tell you, when I landed in Toronto and I had a heavy Acadian accent and uh, I stuttered and stammered and... Uh, my uh, town had, uh, you know, 2,000 people or 3,000 people in it, and I moved to Toronto, um, where I remember my boss telling me, um, uh, you know, you speak English really, really well. And I didn't want to tell him that English was my first language because he figured he had a heavy French <laughs> accent. I didn't realize that there were H's in the English language, mother, father, <laughs> brother. So it took a he while. Said, okay, instead of hockey. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And, uh, I mean, you know, there's no tricks, uh, there's no silver bullet. I just think it's sort of getting out there and it's connecting and learning different things on a daily basis. Um, I'm doing a similar session with engineers and architects tomorrow. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, my only connection to engineering is that my dad's an engineer. But I've now been working with engineers in some way, shape, or form for 30 years um, without really realizing it. 
and and so but but these are tools that I think everybody can use if you're 22 you're finishing up your first degree or you're at state doing a two-year program or you're 52 and you've just been laid off and you're looking for something and everybody in between so um, I'm sure that Bruce would be happy to answer any of your questions by email I will yeah. uh, send him off if you can connect with him I will send you his his uh, contact information I'll send him to you as well so he might ask yeah. you if you want to be on his list so that if he has something coming up in your area that you um, if you want to know about it and yeah. so I think we'll probably just leave it at that unless we have a few people on the line who might like to, to ask a question or make a comment I know we've got Carlos Dennis Elena Heidi and Alana uh, Moteri I don't know if anybody has something they would like to say or ask before we shut down for the day. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for, for your time. It was very, very interesting. Wonderful. Is this uh, Carlos? Yeah, this is Carlos. C Carlos, what, uh, what career are you currently in? I'm, I was laid off. Yeah. Um, so I'm looking for jobs and I'm uh, drafting. My my area was drafting. Um, yes. And I was working for the oil comp or oil industry, but really yep. difficult right now. Are you here in uh, Calgary? No, Edmonton. Oh, okay. Okay. We do have a uh, sister organization in Edmonton, as uh, Marie had mentioned. Um, and uh, um, if you send me an email, I can I can uh, connect them to you. It might be it it might be somebody worth sort of talking to. I was going to say if you were here in Calgary, let's go for some coffee and, and and sort of figure out what some of the next paths are. But I mean, as a drafts person, I see a lot of the great skills that you've got. Uh, that uh, that uh, you've got that could be transferable, particularly into the supply chain business, for sure. Oh, you're right. analytical, uh, you're very visual, um, um, and if you're doing actual drafting, uh, you know that's a part of the merchandising world as well. So there's some, you know, there's some different ways of looking at your own skill sets, for sure. Yeah. Oh, thank so you very Carlos, much. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, Carlos. If you, if you want to get a hold of, I put it into the chat box. Uh, Eric E R I E C is the same organization as what uh, Bruce does in Calgary, and uh, and and so Doug Piquette and Elena, that who was on the the line, there are people that are there that can help you out with making the transfer into a new into a new job, and they also have excellent job fairs where people find work uh, very you know specific to certain fields. So it's it's quite useful. I, I suggest checking them out. Yeah, I will. And thank you very much. Yeah. And I will send you my resume. Please do. Yeah. Yep. 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 Yeah. 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 Exactly. Good. So thank I'm going to have to, people. Some people are saying they have to go and they have to run. So I'm seeing yep. that in the chat boxes. So I'm, I Great. think you should say that this is the end of the webinar since we're to the end of our hour. And Bruce, thank you again so very much. It was uh, excellent. Thank you, Marie. I really Bruce. enjoyed having you as a presenter. And have a wonderful day, everybody. And uh, uh, stay tuned for upcoming. Uh, uh, events that are useful that you Wonderful. can sign up for. So thanks, Bruce. Yes, thank thanks. you for the opportunity, Marie. Goodbye, everybody. Okay, Bye. cheers all.